Welcome to The Property Planet, a podcast with Simon Howley and Amanda Perotten of Bell Howley Perotten, the show all about the tax and legal issues surrounding property ownership, where we discuss everything that affects property investors and developers and go deep into the details to unravel the advice, highlight the traps you can fall into and dispel the myths surrounding property ownership in the UK. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Property Planet podcast, uh, where we're delighted to uh, once again welcome Rod Turner for a chat regarding what's new in the market. Finances, stock, buildings, buying, selling, everything. Welcome, Rod. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good to see you both again. <laughs> yes, it's very good to see you, Rod. Um, so kind of a, just a generalised conversation, really, about your what, what the current mood is in the property market market for landlords you're always particularly obviously with the uh, general election coming up that's quite an interesting mix of promises and counter promises and what will happen how the markets will react to the prospect of a new Labour government potentially so um, yeah how are you finding things out in the jungle so I mean the last couple of years has been a bit of a funny market in property because um, obviously from the Liz Trust kind of movement uh, of the of the gilt markets, which kind of pushed up all the, everyone's mortgage rates. Um, and it took a bit of a while for people to realise these, these aren't coming down as quickly as we thought they were. So life is going to continue. And that's really what we've seen over the last, I guess, three to six months probably, is transactions starting to happen much more frequently. So we're in a market at the moment where things are starting to move now. Um, there's an awful lot of stock on the market. There's more stock than there was kind of pre-COVID. Um, so do you think that? Kind of I was going to say, do you think that is um, landlords offloading stock? Um, what do you well, think is driving that that increase? It's difficult to tell from the data because um, you've got people with second homes, and then you've got limited companies obviously selling. Now. There definitely is an element of your, your tired landlord selling up where they own personally. And who can blame them when you look at past performance and the amount of effort that goes into it? And it's not just tax, it's legislation. And I don't know, it's something like 200 pieces of legislation just to rent out a property or something ridiculous like that. And all that happens is new legislation gets added on when none of the actual existing legislation is enforced and it's kind of papering over the cracks. So yeah. there definitely is an element of landlords leaving the market. Um, and also because you're looking at the age range of a lot of landlords as well. And so you've got a lot of baby boomers that are coming to retirement and actually owning a buy-to-let property or buy-to-let property portfolio is a lot of effort. Yeah. <laughs> as, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, it is running a business um, for not just for the process of incorporation, but it is. It's, it's a lot of work. And so when you get to a certain age, suddenly that kind of uh, balanced fund or even even now annuities uh, are starting to look a bit more attractive to some people. So I think I think that is an element. Does that mean that suddenly there's a lot less stock on the market than there was? N- not Not as much as people might think. And that's because existing landlords, the ones who hopefully are a bit like me, building in a limited company, set up maybe, um, other different kind of wrappers. The message has always been from 2015 with George Osborne, which was, if you want to be a landlord, go big or go home. Um, and he's, he's done his job. <laughs> he, he did what he set out to do yeah. in terms of professionalising the industry. And so what that's meant is the people that are staying in are picking up a lot more market share. So... Yes, the figures are showing a small decline, but it's not as big as kind of everyone who's leaving the market might make out. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. so that's been an issue. There's, there's also another interesting one in terms of mortgages where we spoke about these are based on guilt rates and swap rates. One of the things that's quite interesting is what's happening with banks, um, credit lines and things like that at the moment, because... We've got to remember, it's it's hard to remember, but if you go back sort of 15 years ago when these were kind of average mortgage rates anyway, lots of banks would earn a decent amount of money on the spread between what savers are depositing in there and what they can lend out. 
the last sort of 15 years, we, everyone's forgotten that because it's purely on what they can borrow for, on, in terms of base rate. Yeah. Um, so actually now, that could be a good thing. What's gone wrong with that is a lot of banks have had this race um, to get customers for deposits. So they've done these quite fantastic deals, really, when you look at it, in terms of savings rates. Now, that's a difficult thing for people who want cheaper mortgages like me, because it means a lot of these banks are stuck now. Holding the interest rate up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Holding these mortgage rates up because they mm. can't take the, take the difference on the spread. So slowly but surely, we're going to start seeing that come down, which should help. But I mean, the days of getting a 2% mortgage are, are not and are not coming back straight away. So yeah. I think people need to understand that. But at the same time, look, rents have gone up as well. I mean, I don't think if, if we look back at kind of pre-trust, the average buy to let has probably gone up about 90% in terms of just interest payments. Um, wow. Not many rents have gone up 90%. No. And then also, I mean, they might have gone up 50%, say, maybe. Um, but also you've got maintenance and other things. So it's definitely squeezed margins, definitely. Mm. But that's on a cash flow basis, and and most landlords, whether they like it or not, are normally looking at total returns over time. And ninety percent of those total returns are probably from capital uh, yeah. rather than the income. So, yeah. from putting money in to buying the land to building to getting tenants in, on average, takes seven years. So, it's not going to move the needle quickly. Um, yeah. We're starting to see some, like I think Blackstone the other day. Uh, announced 500 million going into existing um, properties, existing um, so single family houses and things like that. So there is a bit, but it's still very, very small. Um, yeah. And that just shows that look, if, if you can do it at scale, all of these are operational costs of, of running a portfolio start to look a bit better. But if you've got one property, I mean, look, God, yeah. the fees you're paying for professionals, for maintenance for all these things make up a big proportion of it and suddenly it doesn't look as good as it once did no. um but yeah. you're looking at what, what else can i put my money into so investors are probably looking at that and reits are doing quite well at the moment they had their best week i think in in a few years last week um so again that's across the board so that can be a lot of commercial as well um not just not just residential but yeah the market's moving in the right way it's still got some headwinds and we know the value of rents. I mean, you, you hear a lot of landlords say things like, oh, well, this will be passed on to the renters. So these costs that we're incurring will have to be passed on. Now that's all well and good, but really renting is about affordability. And if they don't have the money to pay it, yeah. one of two things will happen. Either you won't get paid your rent or You'll get your your rent paid, and other things will suffer, like maintenance, because they might not turn the heating on during winter, and suddenly you've got mould issues, and then and then you've got bigger maintenance problems. So it's not quite true to say it's going to get passed on, because it really is based on affordability. And at the moment, places like London really are at their max of how much of a household's income can be spent on rent, and one of two things can can affect or can change that. One, wages grow which always lags, so normally it lags. Now, if wages do grow, yes, that's good, but it's also bad because it means inflationary pressures are still there. Yeah. Um, so well, I know around. with, uh, I mean, my youngest daughter sort of looking at, uh, you know, rental in London, and, you know, it is, it's prohibitive. I mean, she's a, she's a graduate, so income's relatively low, and um, it's just that affordability is just is is really really difficult. So, so I, I think it's absolutely the case that certainly London or and I'm sure like lots of cities are kind of almost maxed out on that passing down because people just because the wages are not keeping keeping track with the way that the rents are moving. Well, I mean, in April we have one of the biggest rises in minimum wage. OK, in terms of percentages that we've ever had. OK, so suddenly that market has really shot up in terms of what they can afford. Now, the difficulty with looking at the lower value end of households in terms of what they're earning is that other staples of living that a household needs to spend money on 
food, transport, clothing, kind of all, all those things, they, they remain constant wherever you are in the UK, give or take, yeah? Um, housing doesn't, okay? So if suddenly your housing budget is going from 25% of household income up to 30% of household income, where's that coming from? Mm. Because you've got no discretionary budget. You've got no discretionary spending. So, And also you've got to remember that, well, energy costs are still going up. Transport costs are going up. Food is, is just about stabilised now. So where's it coming from? <laughs> but, I mean, even even with food stabilised, food, food probably, I mean, it has stabilised, but it's stabilised high. Yeah, after you've had, I don't know, 20% inflation over, say, the last two years. I don't know what that figure is, but it's, it's yeah, it's, mm. it's fairly high. But it is now. It is. If you look at what the CPI figures that just came out kind of, I think, last month, it is down below 2% now. So, yeah, it's growing slowly. Mm. Um, under under the rate of inflation, which is good, and under the rate of wage growth, so real terms it is down, but it's 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 a it's a bit difficult with the, this stuff. It's a bit like kind of when people talk about um, climate change and making sure that the, like our country is doing really well, at not giving off greenhouse gases. Well, we're all on the same earth, and if China's blowing loads out, it doesn't really <laughs> make a difference, does it? So yeah. we've kind of got to look at everything as one. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we want to get the environment in this particular conversation. <laughs> Just hear planet on the uh, title. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, look, rents have definitely gone up, but you've got to remember, like, housing is all about location and where people want to be. Um, and so, yeah, look, if you want to come to London and you're just puny, you might want to go in, in Clapham. It's going to be expensive, huge amount of demand. But if you can get out and into like shared housing, so HMOs, where actually bills are all built in and you can be 20 minutes away from Clapham, suddenly you're going to find actually, yeah, this is affordable. And if you think, look, 30 times my, my wage is kind of what we're looking at for affordability, um, suddenly it starts to look quite healthy. So there's always going to be places to go. It's just what people's priorities are, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I suppose actually sort of getting rid of um, exiting the, uh, you know, the the market or, and selling off stock, that is that brings with it a whole sort of tax implication because especially if you've got it in either, you know, you're liquidating your company or you're selling off in your personal names, that's quite a burden. <laughs> This is the big thing, um, because often people might look at, again, I'm going to use tired old landlords as, as they are, but they might look at their portfolio, Christ, this is yielding kind of these minute yields, and what's the point in having it? Well, the point is, actually, if you crystallise those gains and you do sell it, and you look at what your net return is on, on your releasable equity, i.e. the equity you'll get back after paying tax, then actually you think, yeah, it's probably, it's just not worth selling. Yeah. Um, so you do find that people are kind of do get to that where they're, they're a little bit stuck because, right, do we sell and crystallise the massive gain of when we bought this flat for a fiver in 1983 and now it's worth half a million quid? Or what do we do? And Which is why incorporation is obviously has um, a lot of people looking at it as a, as a, as a positive thing from that yeah. point of view. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's – look, if it, would, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. Um, I just want to say in terms of kind of like those rental stock, the other thing is obviously social housing um, in terms of where, like, what, if you look at kind of residential rental properties, private rentals make up a small portion of that. The bigger portion is in housing associations and councils. Um, now, councils, aren't building any more properties on the whole at very very low numbers housing associations and registered providers are doing a bit nowhere near enough i mean if you go back to 1950s i mean councils were were, were doing most of the building um so now what's happening is a lot of those social tenancies are being pushed onto the private sector to help bolster that now that's not really sustainable um, so something's got to happen there. Either the housing associations need to start getting a lot more stock or councils not need to start building more. 
or there needs to be a little bit more kind of carrot rather than stick for the private sector to go into that space to fill the gap because again if you think about how long it takes to build things to get tenants in it's about seven years on average mm. so i mean but i mean if you look at someone who was at birmingham council i mean they're bankrupt um so most of them are. Good, yeah. so i mean I mean, the, yeah, one, of, one, of, one of the things, one of the issues is that, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be here all day if I need to tell you about kind of how incapable council people, council <laughs> are doing things, but, but you've got to also remember that they're completely overworked. I mean, if you look at the planning system for a, for a start, I mean, why anyone would want to stay in, the, in, a, in a local authority planning system when they could go into private practice? God fair play to them they're overworked they've got way too much cases if you look at something like the average planning um documents coming it's over a thousand pages to read i mean god it's an absolute nightmare the whole system's completely flawed so i do feel a bit sorry for them in that respect but then you've got things like right why didn't they take advantage of all that cheap money there was government yeah. backed uh, bonds that they could use for housing which never got used I mean, to be honest, they need to still, it's still relatively cheap to do it even now. So they still should be doing it. Problem is we've got short term outlooks in this country because they're based on four year political cycles. And for yeah. everything China does badly, what they do well is have a long term outlook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they party in power for 50 years or whatever it is. But yeah. <laughs> so then you're going to get a, a change of government in uh what six five weeks time five four yeah. five weeks time and then it's all going to change again well do you know what if we look back at the last election when sort of jeremy corbyn was in the running i think that had a much bigger effect on what the housing market was doing in terms of investors putting money in um compared to now i don't think it's having any well it's probably gonna have a very small effect but really not material um if you look at kind of what a lot of the policies are in terms similar. of labor i mean god they're, they're kind of we're doing them already at the moment like yeah. so i think in and, and also i think if you look back through history um i think there's lots of kind of studies that have been done in the last few weeks because of the general election about how it affects housing how a general election actually affects it and it's very minimal I mean, the Corbyn one was probably the biggest one in, in recent times. Well, probably um, the uh, Liz Truss one was probably one of the, uh, well, I suppose that wasn't a general election, but a change of prime minister was uh, quite... But that um, wasn't a political issue. That was a, that was a financial one. Because yeah. It's a policy one, yeah. Yeah. So actually, you might have a political issue happens and then rates come down because of, I don't know, that political decision has caused an economic issue. I'm not sure that's probably going to be the case, but it's all. Yeah. Well, I mean, the it? only thing I do think with with the rates, though, is that um, they have been unrealistically low for way too long. So, I mean, if I think um, when I bought my first house, the rates were, I don't know, I think something like four. I think I think locked in about fourteen percent. Yeah, yeah. Which you couldn't actually even imagine those sorts of rates in today's oh. economic climate. They would absolutely cripple everybody because of everything that's gone in the in well, the interim. I think this is a misconception, really, because the the rate is not the important thing. Okay, so how high the rate is is not what's important. What's important is the velocity of getting to that rate. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at what happened with trust, that was a proportional much higher velocity of a change in rate than it was in 1989 when it went 16%. Yeah. Okay. Because it went from 12 to 16. Now, the difference between 12 and 16, my math isn't good enough, is, I don't know, let's call it 20%, whereas the difference between 0.5% and 5% is about 800%. Yeah. That's um, so, so it's huge when you think what your interest payments are going to be. So that's what's more important. It's not how high or how low the rate is. It's the difference from what it starts to to what it ends up and how quickly it, it takes to get there that is yeah. the absolute killer point for interest rates. And also, like, when it was 14%, it was still, you're looking at, well, what proportion of a household's income yeah. 
servicing that interest rate. And yeah. whether it's two percent or whether it's twenty percent, it doesn't matter. What matters is how much of a household's income. Because remember, during that time, other things are going on, like wage increases. Yeah. Well, we we did say that actually. It was at, at that time when you could afford the mortgage, you could afford that interest rate. You could also afford to go out. You know, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. You could afford to put petrol in your car, buy a few beers, go on holiday. You know, and, and I think sort of in terms of the affordability of life in general was significantly different um, yeah. to how it is today. So that does have massive impact. I and mean, even when they're looking at house prices in real terms, they're still under, well, I think they're around where they were over 10 years ago in real terms. So again, it's kind of, it's always a bit tricky looking at house prices because not everyone buys in cash, especially first time buyers. You, most people tend to buy in a, with a mortgage. That being said, we've, we've got a very healthy housing market in terms of loan to value. I think it's about eight trillion pounds in residential UK with, with under two trillion of debt. It's, it's not about loan to value, but whereas if you look at what like in 2007 and, and 1990, God, the loan to value was massive in UK mm. residential. So, how is that? Is that impacting landlords' decisions to incorporate? Then, I mean, do you do you get a feeling for people that you're discussing this with um, about what they want to do or what they feel they should be doing, or are they just completely stuck? Oh my God, definitely. Um, one of <laughs> Landlords might not like me for saying this, but I find it, I think when George Osborne, who is absolutely loathed by the kind of the, the, the landlord market and residential property investors, bringing in Section 24, but the reason he did it was to professionalise the industry. Now, we've got landlords in the last couple of years who have owned properties for the 20 years, suddenly going, oh, God, I think I've got to incorporate. Now, that sums up why the industry needed to be professionalised. We've known about this since 2015. Yeah. So why on earth are people suddenly deciding now that they need to incorporate when they've had all this time? And it's not like it's been a sudden thing. It's been layered in. So all that tells me is, well, OK, Yes, the, the, the sector did need some level of professionalisation because clearly if people are thinking that now and they've been in it this long, they haven't been planning for it. Um, that being said, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's either like go big or go home. If you want to stay in the game, yeah. do it. If not, you've got two options. You sell up or you pay down the debt and you can still do it without utilising mortgages. So... I think they're the options for people. It's it's not difficult. Either yeah. pay it down or sell up and put it into something else. Yeah. I mean, I th or, or to incorporate. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. And and I think I think actually sort of lenders are after the blip are quite agreeable. I mean, we're not, I mean, there's always been the niche lenders that will lend in these sort of circumstances, but there doesn't seem to be an absence in the market of lenders that are prepared to lend. Oh my God, you've got like now there's products coming out where you can, you're lending on, on something where you're, where you're getting a property or you've got an existing property and you're going through incorporation. So they'll happily lend on something that's personally owned that's going to end yeah. up being a limited company on the same product. So yeah. lenders absolutely are, are on board with this. Um, I mean, the lending market is healthy. There's plenty of capital out there looking for a home. Um, yeah. so, so there's an awful lot of products. There's an awful lot of lenders, whether it's kind of term lending, bridge lending. I mean, um, I'm part of 978 Finance, so they recently we've done some lending into trusts. So for trusts have, have, have in the past always been an issue where actually uh, there hasn't been a big pool of lenders lending properties either held in trust or properties owned by companies held in trust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's starting to change. Uh, we're seeing that because some of these again older landlords have decided rather than incorporate, they might start putting things into trust for a inheritance planning or estate planning point of view there's um i mean there's all sorts of different sectors as well within residential you've got social housing supported living this sort of stuff as well 
plenty of lenders out there for it. I mean, there's there's certain traps people need to be careful of, but limited company lending is, I mean, really mainstream. It's mainstream, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, what what do you think is? So, do you think it? I mean, do you think it is a lack of professionalism, which seems quite um, possibly unfair on on landlords as to why they're not doing something? What do you think is causing the intransigence? No, I, I, I don't. Well, if you look at the private rental sector and you look at what it's typically been in the past, it's typically been a couple, each own a home, get together, share then a marital home and they've got one buy to let property. OK, that's typically your, your typical story of what you have. And then, or you get people that go, right, I'm going to get one buy to let as my pension. OK, and so they have played in the rules that are there at the time, which is absolutely fair enough. The problems started when there's all this different changes have come about. And so obviously, if you're, I don't know, a doctor saving people's lives and you've got a buy to let in the background that you're thinking, right, this is going to be my pension when I'm older. Of course, you're not going to be kind of finger on the pulse, looking at every kind of tax change, looking at every regulationary change. Because why would you? You've got more important things. Um, and that, that, I think, has been the issue. Um, now, a lot of those landlords would have been absolutely great landlords, would have provided great accommodation, uh, would have provided a great service. What's happened is there's been some that haven't, and they wanted to be flushed out. Um, and really, kind of, it, there's an element of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but on the whole, it kind of look. These are things we can't change, so uh, there's no point in kind of sitting there whinging about it. We've got to get on with it. Um, some people have suggested that what happened in Ireland, where essentially they bought out an equivalent of Section 24 and then they reversed it, um, might happen. Um, other people have said, oh, right, actually, um, what they're going to do is they're going to start putting Section 24 onto limited companies as well. Yeah. I, can't, I can't see that happening. Um, because one, politic, it would be political suicide where everything is reliant on the private rental sector. Um, because now we're seeing actually that political parties are seeing that. So people like Ben Beadle from the NRLA has done, has done a great job in kind of bringing actually to the forefront what the issues are. It's not landlords are the devil. It's actually we're, we're providing a service because the social and in terms of uh, housing associations and councils are not doing what they were in yep. the past. Mm. So, yeah, it, it is a bit unfair to say a lack of professionalisation. But what I mean when I'm saying that is that's what that government at the time set out to do. And they've done it. Like, yep. whether we think it's right or not, whether we think they should have or not, it happened. And lots of those tired landlords have left the market. Um, and if they if they don't want to, then fine, great. You've got to be a good landlord. But if you don't want to be impacted by Section 24, pay down debt or incorporate. Yeah. But there's no yeah. point in incorporating unless you want to unless you want to grow a bit more. Because yeah. And I, th I think as well that um, what we often find is that um, people. I mean, obviously, there's there's the ripple effect, and um, how far out do you go with the various ripples? But um, you know, if you if you stick with it just in your personal names, then you're going to get a hefty IHT bill at the end potentially as well. Or if you sell it, you're going to get a hefty CGT bill. So there's there's always a something. So you can't just hang your hat on one thing. And if this reverse, so if you take take the island example that you, you mentioned, you know, if they did reverse Section 24, that, that's only going to solve one element and yeah, maybe it doesn't I mean, even solve that. Absolutely. I think, I think incorporation is not just about Section 24, as you're kind of no. alluding to. It's, no. it's, that's the thing that's been brought to the forefront. But even if Section 24 was reversed, I'd still be owning in limited companies yeah. but all the other reasons of risk and protection and estate planning and various mm. other things that it that it gives you as well so it's, yeah great point it's not just about that and obviously you guys will know far more on that than yeah. i would um but yeah and, I, and 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 i think like one point is wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to pay capital gains tax or, <laughs> or, or, yeah. or, or yeah. and all these things <laughs> 
Yeah, you I do. think it's always been really difficult to get to get clients to think long term. Yeah, well, that's the I, issue. I mean, the, the, the partly it's hard to not well, in cats, but nudge them along. But that they see things transactional wise. They don't really see it as like an incorporation into a company, and they can use that to plan ahead, whatever, so on. Obviously, because people don't know when they're the forties or fifties. They won't give away all their assets into a trust, which will work great for certain taxes. But then again, yeah. they might need it in five years' time. I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? It's so subjective. What what works for someone won't necessarily work for someone else. And also, yeah. it's hard to think long term because, I mean, you don't know what you're going to be. You, your needs yeah. are going to be long term. Yeah. Are you, are you going to have? I don't know. Are you going to be old and sick and need care costs? Are you going to? I don't know. Wouldn't it be great if we all knew when we were going to die <laughs> so we could plan these things? <laughs> but I think as well, you know, with, with we find as well is that the sort of the, the reticence is also about the fees. So, well, how much is it going to cost me to do this? Well, it's going to cost you X. Oh, well. Oh. But and that comes, I think, back to a bit of short termist thinking as well, because actually it's just an investment into taking you to the to a, a next and potentially better position o overall in, in the grand scheme of things. And I think that that's what well, I was chatting to somebody this morning and, you know, the client wants the advice provided it doesn't cost them too much and there aren't too many sort of arrangement fees and they avoid having to pay any kind of tax and um, they don't have to move X into Y. And it's like, it just doesn't exist. Yeah, well, it, it might do, but then that causes bigger problems later, doesn't it? So Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, we've, we've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because when you invest in property, like we're talking about direct investment, really what we're talking, what, what, what it is, is private equity. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at what we can put in now and what we're going to get back at a certain point in time. So it's not about cash flows. It's about the total returns over a period of time. So if you take that feeling into or thought process into kind of costs, if you've got to pay X amount for an incorporation, you've got two things. One, you've got to make sure you've got the cash flow to stay in the game. Um, so can you actually afford to pay it? Have you got the cash to, to pay it now? Otherwise, you could go under. But the big point is, well, What's, how's this going to affect what we end up with in 7, 10, 20 years or what the kids get kind of thing? So I think that's – and it's hard to do that, isn't it? Because you're, yeah. you're looking but, – but it's, it kind of it contradicts what property investment is all about, which is quite a long-term asset class because it's so bloody yeah. illiquid. Um, yes. So, you, yeah, it's, it's tricky. And also, look, no one likes paying fees, do they? So it's it's about understanding kind of what they're for and understanding the bigger picture really and 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 looking at it as in terms of return on investment over time and if I'm putting this money in as a I don't know a capital expense how is that going to increase everything or mm. or, or over, I, over I, the I do wonder from what you're saying there as well if people do perceive it actually and maybe they're the landlords that you're talking about flushing out but if they do actually perceive it as you know, purely you're in it for the long game and this is a long-term investment, you know, actually are they looking at enhancing their monthly income um, and therefore because it's not enhanced, they don't perceive that the effort that they're putting into managing and maintaining as part of that end game in 20, 25 years' time, they're actually looking at it that they're working for nothing because they're not getting that enhanced well, monthly yeah. income. It depends, doesn't it? And this goes back to it being subjective. So I don't know if you're if you're just starting out building a portfolio and thinking, right, I don't know, I don't need the income now because I'm building this as more of a pension pot. And, and look, let's face it, any investment is 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 for your pension, not not the pension wrapper, but it's for retirement, isn't it? It's whether you retire at 25 on a beach drinking cocktails all day. Or whether it's at 70 is irrelevant it's it's for when you are not capable or don't want to do the kind of operational activities anymore so i think it just depends on someone's timeline if, if you're if you're building that pot and really property is just the thing that the money is invested into what what everyone really cares about is the value isn't it yeah. so it's, if you think of whatever it is as the pot of, of value you're, you're building that because that then gives you options, whether that's equity and properties or, I don't know, um, 
the stock market is kind of irrelevant, really, because we just care about the value of something and the value of it today and at a point in time. And if we need to liquidate it, what's it going to be like and how long does it take to liquidate? Yeah. So if you're, I don't know, again, one of these older people that don't, cares more about the cash flow, it's more of a fixed income model, in, in, in which case, yeah, you might think, right, I'm only in this for a couple of days. I, I might have terminal cancer and be going to pop my clock soon. So I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to make sure that I've got the cash rate to have a good life and whatever happens after happens. Yeah. Or it might be that, no, I'm building this. So I don't know, it uh, goes in on, onto the kids or so that in 20 years, I, I, I am at that point where I can benefit from those things. So, it, yeah, it's really tricky, isn't yeah. it, to kind of, to model that i mean i guess that's why we have kind of decent wealth planners or financial planners or whatever it is that you call them these days but it's to it's to, it's to look at what you need yeah. over a period of time in terms of what your life's going to have if you just have kids i mean are there going to be uni fees are there going to be i don't know are you going to have to help them on the property ladder are you going to have oh. care costs? are you yes. going to want to yes. actually travel the world <laughs> or are you not going to be capable of traveling the world because you're too old and sick by the time that you do have to <laughs> yeah. because you've spent all your money and your efforts on your kids yeah exactly <laughs> well, you said incorporation where you didn't need to or something like that <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so i'm so I'm, in, I'm interested in the in the in the financing you know because obviously um we've looked a lot at um clients with family investment companies which is a great model for refinancing flexible maintains control obviously the things that are more inflexible in a trust so how how are the lenders responding to to the trusts then well look, where, where there's where there's a need funnily enough products are created aren't they and it's look you can look at any industry within property and where you start seeing a need and a decent market for it look at supported living contracts, look at some of these uh, different leases that are coming in from providers about helping suddenly, we, I mean, we spoke to a bank kind of a couple of months ago and, and literally had a meeting with them to say, there's a lot of demand here for a new product. I think we need to sit down and come up with one. What's stopping you from lending on these types of um, tenancies or lease agreements? And we went through it and we just then had the provider in and go, we've got to make these changes for it to work. And, and that's what it's all about. So whether it's trust, whether it's um, a specific kind of provider in a home, whether it's a corporate lease, whatever it is, if there's enough demand, you're going to see a product uh, product being created. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's as, as simple as that, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what was it that they felt that they wanted to get? Because obviously, traditionally, they the lenders haven't liked trusts because of the control element. So yeah. what has convinced them otherwise? Well, I guess if you look at it, like you mentioned the family uh, investment company. I mean, if yeah. we were back 10 years ago, God, lenders wouldn't like those at all for residential property, lending yeah. on a holding company that then owns a subsidiary um, company that then owns the property. They didn't like that. And and people, some people still think we're in that lending world. Yeah. It's nonsense. That lenders are fine as long as they're, the beneficial interest remains the same going up the ladder. Yeah. And it's the same thing with trust. If whoever is in control or the beneficiaries, um, that's what's important. It's who's benefiting from these. It's a bit like PGs as well. Yeah. Not every lender will require a PG. Um, yeah. which people sometimes are shocked about. Um, sometimes it's just that question. I mean, we had a development the other day where we suddenly went back to the lender and went, um, regarding the PG, we're not going to do it for the whole amount. We'll do it for 10% of it and any cost overruns. And they were, yes, fine. Okay, great. Because they're lending on the loan to value. So it is, I mean, it's funny, isn't it, how things change. If you tried that, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, they might you might have got laughed out of the room. Um, yeah. But so yeah. almost just like an, an education, really. So sort of educating the lenders that their security is secure. Yeah, and, and say, if you don't feel this is secure, and they might come back and go, well, yeah, we, we don't. We've, we're, this is a really high loans value, therefore we need a bit yeah. more comfort. Um, or it might be that, well, you've got no skin in the game, therefore we need 
a BG. So yeah. exactly, it's it's it, it's so dependent on the deal, isn't it? I mean, yeah. It's, I think it's, I still think it's interesting though, and I think it's a it's a good it's a very positive development. Look, we we want more entrance into the lending market because it creates competition and and mm. and drives quality of service and and cost as well, doesn't it? It's an efficient market, mm. so it can only be a good thing. And we do have a lot of lenders around, whether it's development finance, bridging, buy to lets, or any sort of specialist lending as well. So. That's a good thing, um, and yeah. we want more of it because yeah. it, it, it makes everything better. Yeah, sure. Well, fascinating, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all your really useful insights. It's been uh, it's been an education in itself. So, always a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for listening and tune in next time when we discuss more of the tax and legal issues surrounding your business and property needs. 